welcome everybody. My name is, for those of you who may not know me, I am Mike Hansen, and I currently have the privilege of serving as the director for the Department of Public Safety's Office of Traffic Safety. This afternoon, we have well, what I know is gonna be a very interesting uh, initial exploration into the world of connected and automated vehicles and the technology that goes with them. We've assembled a, a very diverse panel of subject matter experts who are gonna talk about some of the potential uh, benefits uh, and some of the potential impacts of what connected and automated vehicle technology will mean to all of us here in Minnesota. Of course, because we're all tuning into this particular webinar, we all know that safety is certainly gonna be uh, one of those highlighted uh, topics that we're gonna discuss today. So I'd like to thank our partners at the Minnesota Department of Transportation and the Minnesota Department of Health uh, for their help and their sponsorship with today's uh, webinar. And also uh, big thanks to all of our partners at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration whose funding and support also makes uh, a good deal of our uh, presentation possible. So um, basically how we're going to uh, run uh, the uh, afternoon is the session is going to be recorded and it will be posted later for those who were not able to tune in live. We will also make available uh, copies of all of the PDFs and uh, professional development hours forms will also be available for those of you who wish to take advantage of uh, those opportunities. So we have an hour and a half and uh, we will kick off with our speakers shortly. Um, we're gonna have the speakers share their thoughts, their perspective and their ideas. And then we are going to have a question and answer session. So we're gonna ask everybody to please hold your questions until we get through all of the speakers and then we will uh, jump right in and answer as many of your questions as we can. If we can't get through all of the questions, we will certainly record them and make sure that uh, somebody gets back and responds to you with those answers. So our panel today, very distinguished uh, group of individuals who have been closely involved with uh, the Connected and Automated Vehicle Program here in Minnesota. First of all, from the Minnesota Department of Transportation, we are privileged to have Kristen White join us today. Kristen is the director of the MnDOT uh, Connected and Automated Vehicle section and is just an absolute wealth of knowledge and enthusiasm when it comes to how we can embrace this technology, not only to make our roads safer, more efficient, but to benefit our entire society as a whole. We're also joined by another very distinguished uh, speaker today with Lisa Kahn. Lisa is a huge traffic safety advocate and has been for years and years and years. She brings a passion and commitment to the Minnesota Safety Council in all things traffic safety related. And she's got some really great thoughts to share with us today. And then we also are uh, glad to have Wayne Sandberg with us today from the Washington County uh, Engineer's Office and also representing the Minnesota Association of County Engineers. I believe I have that correct, Wayne. And uh, Wayne is going to talk about some of the local impacts and local benefits that connected and automated vehicle technology uh, will bring to us today. So uh, with that, we will kick off. And I have uh, a few things um, that I want to share with you. Just uh, some of the perspectives uh, from uh, Department of Public Safety and the Office of Traffic Safety. And as uh, Linda is uh, very capably uh, bringing up the electronic version of our uh, program today. There we go. So we're gonna talk about Minnesota's Connected and Automated Vehicle Innovation Alliance and our Safety Committee today. Obviously, all of us on this call have a vested interest in traffic safety. And so uh, we'll be uh, jumping into that uh, in, a, in a good way here shortly. Next slide, please, Linda. There we go. For those of you who may not be aware of, of how did the, the CAV Advisory Council all come about? Well, if you think back to uh, when Governor Dayton was in office, uh, connected and automated vehicle technology was rapidly evolving and rapidly advancing in many parts of the country. And Minnesota wanted to prove to be a leader when it comes to CAV, as Minnesota has been a leader in many aspects of traffic safety and connected and automated vehicles, quite honestly, is a step into the future and is a step toward 
a much safer roadway system. Now, as much as I'd like to tell you that next week, we're all gonna be able to go jump into our self-driving car and not have to worry about things anymore. Um, that's not gonna happen. Um, Kristen will get into uh, a great deal of detail on, on some of the timing and, and things that we can look for in the future. But the long story short is technology takes a long time to develop. It takes a long time to validate and it takes a long time to be accepted. So we have a significant period ahead of us that is really, it's fraught with challenges, but also with opportunities. Um, as cab vehicles begin to enter our fleet, we're going to have a mixed fleet. And so we're going to need to know how human beings who are still in control of their car uh, relate to and interact with a connected and automated vehicle uh, that is actually designed to do everything according to the law and everything that is safe. And I think anybody who spent any time on our roads lately knows that the some of our human being partners out there do everything but those safe things. So the vision is to build a future transportation system that is first of all safe, one that is equitable, it's accessible, and it's efficient and healthy, and it's sustainable. All of those things are, are really important as we look to the future, because if we don't, if we ignore any of those, the, the whole concept of the benefit of cab technology comes crashing down around us. So it really does take a, a wide view of everything that CAB can and will do for us. Now, the mission is to collaborate with all of our stakeholders and every one of you on the call today is a stakeholder. So I would encourage you, if you hear something today that interests you, dig into it, contact one of the panel members, contact me um, and, and we can help to point you in a direction where you can take a little deeper dive into what you're taking a look at and also tell you how you can be a bigger part of CAB in Minnesota. We need to partner with our academic institutions and our private industry. Private industry is really what is driving this CAB technology and the, the huge benefits that will, it will bring both economically and from an efficiency standpoint and then also, as I've mentioned uh, several times now, from the safety standpoint. And then we need to engage with all of our communities in Minnesota so that they understand what this emerging technology can and will mean for them and how it will benefit their communities. And probably right up there near the top, we need to educate our communities that we are not gonna put anything on the road that is not safe. One of the biggest hurdles that, that CAV faces right now is acceptance. And so the more we can engage with our communities and prepare them for this technology, the more they will accept it. And the more they accept it, the more prevalent it will become. Next slide, please, Linda. The Minnesota CAB program is made up really of four layers of, uh, of CAB involvement. First of all, we have the large governor's advisory council. These are the folks that really do plot the future for Minnesota. They shape the policy, they shape the, the, the future, they help shape the laws and, and everything that is involved with this. And it's made up of you know, folks from government, go, uh, from industry, from academia. It really is a well-rounded and balanced and, and rather large uh, input group that provides the direction and uh, provides the, the uh, policies that we are all gonna need in order to take advantage of the future. The Innovation Alliance, this is government, industry, and research, and everything else that, that comes in between. We're going to get into the Innovation Alliance in a little bit more detail here shortly, because that's really where the safety subcommittee comes in and uh, where we the rubber hits the road, so to speak. We have uh, the interagency CAV team, and this, again, is a wide range of stakeholders that are involved in this that provide input, direction, guidance, and policy-making material so that all of us uh, can make good, sound, reasoned decisions. And then, uh, certainly, the CAVX team and internal MnDOT working group, uh, which are really uh, responsible for putting together not only this work group, but are for driving some of the behind-the-scenes but critically important aspect of bringing CAV to Minnesota. Next slide, please, Linda. CAV goals, as I mentioned these earlier, equity, mobility, and access. That's probably from a societal standpoint, one of the biggest things that CAV is gonna to bring to us. As we all know, transportation is freedom and transportation also equals economic ability. And so the more access that we can provide to all parts of our society, the more equitable and the more fair it will be for everybody. Jobs and workforce development. 
anything technology related is going to create jobs and it's also going to require that those jobs evolve and grow with the needs of the industry. CAV will bring good, meaningful jobs to Minnesota and in a big way as it continues to roll out. Um, as you've heard me say, traffic safety and efficiency. What the, the, probably the biggest benefit that we will see is the reduction in the crashes and the reduction in all of the mayhem that comes about as a result of traffic crashes. As I think everyone on this call realizes, well over 90% of all motor vehicle crashes are the result of human error. If we can take that human error out of the equation, we have 90% less crashes, and therefore we have a system that is 90% more efficient. Economic equality. Again, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the more access and the more transportation options people have, the more opportunities they have for economic advancement. Multimodal infrastructure. And this is also a key part of CAB, and this is maybe where we'll see some of the first of this technology evolve, is in the commercial vehicle industry. Um, and when we talk about multimodal, um, that's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about commercial vehicles, we're talking about regular motor vehicles, we're talking about transit, we're talking about every way that people get around and how this technology can make that a safer and more efficient trip. And then finally, public health and environment. The more efficient that our transportation system is, the less uh, bad stuff it's gonna put into our environment. And so there are gonna be huge economic uh, and environmental benefits to CAV as well. Next slide, please, Linda. The CAV Innovation Alliance. Now, as you can see on the left side of the screen, you know, the, the five committees that make up the Innovation Alliance are listed there. Safety, obviously uh, one that is near and dear to my heart. I um, co-chair for the safety subcommittee and I'm privileged to do so. And that has, has been and always will be uh, front and center for CAV technology as it's developed and rolled out in Minnesota, is making sure that it is safe and it is safe for all users. And there's all kinds of things that fall underneath that heading that we're gonna take a look at in that safety arena. Everything from crash data collection uh, to vulnerable road user engagement, how does CAV interact with those and, and how do those interact with CAV and, and things like that. Labor and workforce, connectivity and data. Um, if we're talking about connected and automated vehicles, we're talking about a tremendous amount of data and how to protect that. Infrastructure investment. We have a lot of work to do in order to allow these systems to work as designed. And so that's where that infrastructure investment and planning for the next 10, 20, 50 years down the road. And you know, trying to envision technology that doesn't exist today. And then finally, um, and I put this right there with safety, is education and outreach, is selling the benefits of CAF and gaining acceptance. And we do this in a variety of ways that you can see listed there. So the, the Innovation Alliance is really going to uh, organize and align all of our goals together. Uh, we meet on a monthly basis, and we report directly to the Advisory Council. And our job is to collaborate with all kinds of stakeholders in order to make sure that we are providing good, solid, updated information. Next slide, please. The safety committee goals. Very simply, what we've been working on, and we, were, we stood up in February, and we've met a number of times since then. And so first of all, how do we define cab safety? Well, basically, anybody who is in, around, or sharing an operating environment with a cab vehicle needs to feel safe. And that's what safety is. All users feel safe all the time. And then identifying some of those safety principles for the state. And that's a very wide ranging way to put, you know, how do we identify the priorities of safety for cab vehicles and their interaction with the rest of the transportation system. Help Minnesota understand the benefits of cab and why it's important that we continue to take a lead in this. And then also to not only develop, but also feed the research that goes on that will make CAV safer and better in the future and will also enable us to better understand the benefits that we'll, uh, we will all receive from it. Next one, please, Linda. Some of the activities that the Safety Committee has undertaken so far. Um, we're reviewing and have reviewed uh, best practices on CAV safety uh, from many other states across the country. We also do extensive literature reviews. We're trying to and working on developing public outreach uh, material so that people have a better understanding of what we're talking about when we're talking about that. 
And this is particularly important for all of our law enforcement partners and first responders, because with this new technology comes some additional hazards that all of us are gonna to need to be aware of. We wanna get CAB into driver's education classes. We need to prepare today's drivers for tomorrow's technology. The only way we can do that is to get into those driver's education classes. To identify a top 10 list. How is CAB gonna benefit all of us? And that, that's a sales pitch all on its own right there. Make sure that we're keeping an eye on new and emerging CAB technology and make sure that we are communicating in a clear and understandable way with all of our, our stakeholders. If we get too caught up in the technology and the techno speak, um, it, it's gonna be overly complex for most people to understand. Work with manufacturers and academia and all of our partners out there to help create that safety roadmap for AV testing. We know that as technology develops, it has to be tested and it has to be piloted and we need to be part of that. And part of that is research, identifying gaps, where we don't know what we don't know and figure out answers to that. We all know we live in Minnesota, which is a four season state, which presents a whole nother set of challenges, especially for cab technology. So we need to be part of that. And then, uh, you know, I mentioned the commercial vehicle part of this and the demos that can and will be taking place out there. And then also using social media as a platform to educate many of the stakeholders across the state. So this is just a real brief snapshot of what the safety committee has been up to so far and kind of where we're headed into the future. So with that, I would now um, like to stand down for a bit and I would like to turn it over to Kristen White for a bit of an introduction into what uh, she's been working on with her CAV partners at Minda. Well, thank you, Mike. I could listen to Mike Hansen, our traffic safety director, talk all day long, everyone. So I will try and be brief as the director of the Minnesota State CAB program, because I know we're all excited to hear from my colleagues in safety and at the local level and hear from you all today. So my goal here today is to give us just a level playing field of understanding on what CAB is, what it isn't, and when it may or may not be coming. But first, when we talk about CAB, which is the acronym for Connected and Automated Vehicles, we're actually talking about a lot of different innovation trends and technologies. And there's four key trends. If there's one major takeaway to take away from today, the first one is that it's so much more than connected and automated. It's four. It's first, automated vehicles, which I'll talk a little bit about and how there's a difference between an automated technology, which helps a human driver become safer and an autonomous technology which actually takes over a task for the human driver where they don't need to control it. The second is the connected vehicle technology which quite simply is using radio or cell signals to help the com vehicle communicate to another object like another vehicle or road infrastructure like a signal. The third part of technology trend that we think about in this ecosystem is electric vehicle technology or the grid. A vast majority, if not all automated vehicles are now being built on electric vehicle platforms, which shows the industry's commitment to sustainability, but also shows how we need to plan for that electric vehicle future. And last and almost foundationally, because transit was the original shared mobility, many different members of the industry are looking at how we can share these types of technologies, learning from a lot of the evolution from Uber, Lyft, and even the scooter movement nationally to understand how we can use these technologies to share them across communities. So these four items together come up with an acronym that you might hear in other situations or venues called ACES, which many of us now refer to as the connected and automated vehicle industry. So a lot of people will tell you a lot of different things on what an automated, autonomous, and connected vehicle is, but today we want to share with you the facts. So first and foremost, an autonomous vehicle is one that is actually starting as a traditional vehicle that comes right off the manufacturing line, as you see on the screen on the left, but it actually integrates an enormous amount of sensors and technology. So one of the most popular technologies that you might have already read about is LIDAR, which is essentially just pulses of light beaming out from a sensor on top or around the vehicle. You see a little blue burb on top of this sedan. And that helps them communicate back to the vehicle, to the central computer that helps them detect whether there's a tree or a curb or a pedestrian or where the lane line is. And this LIDAR is incredibly important for the safety of these vehicles. 
But it doesn't just take one sensor or piece of technology, it takes an enormous redundant set of sensors and technologies. So most of these vehicles also incorporate cameras in and around the vehicle to both help the computer understand where it is, but the cameras also help the teleoperations, which is typically a remote operator in a different offsite facility who monitors all the vehicles on the roadway. And last thing we'll talk about today is geospatial technology or GPS, which many of us have, but when you're using Google Maps on your smartphone, you might be within a few hundred feet of accuracy. Whereas these vehicles with some of their sophisticated GPS and satellites are sometimes, at least in our Minnesota pilots, within one to two millimeters of accuracy to help the vehicle detect and avoid objects. So an automated vehicle, and I'll talk about this in the next slide, is quite simply just an automate, a vehicle that automates one piece of human driving tasks, but that's so much different than a self-driving car. Now, thinking differently, a different type of technology that sometimes gets confused with this is a connected vehicle. So as I mentioned, connectivity is where they take either a radio signal or a cell signal, or maybe a future technology, and input it into the vehicle so that it can help either talk to or connect with different objects, like to talk to another vehicle in the surrounding environment to help make sure it's not running into the adjacent lane. Another example is some of the newer technologies actually use Bluetooth or other onboard sensors to detect nearby pedestrians and cyclists and people who walk and roll to make sure that they're avoiding these very important road users. But for infrastructure operators like Wayne and myself, you'll hear us talk about one of the key technologies we're looking into is how these vehicle technologies can talk to infrastructure, like a traffic signal. And the benefits of this are really important because upgraded traffic signals, which exist across the metro and area and across Minnesota, can actually detect that a car is coming and talk back to the car and say, hey, I'm about to turn red, so you might want to slow down. This helps support safety in intersections and, of course, eco driving. But conversely, that same signal can then understand this vehicle is going to actually be running this red light. And so I'm going to hold all the other lights in the intersection to make sure that there's no collision. So there's a lot of potential safety benefits in these automated and connected technologies. But if there's a second key takeaway from today's conversation as far as our technology lessons, one thing we want to talk about is self-driving cars don't exist. And yes, you might have heard a lot of different in the news and in other parts of the country in warm climates where there isn't weather or rural roads, there might be some levels of testing of different pieces of automation. But to date, there is no vehicle in the globe that can navigate a Minnesota winter with rural Minnesota roads without traffic signals or lane markings. And that is fact, regardless of what you read. So that's why the Society of Automotive Engineers has helped us understand this evolution in technology that's coming, giving us information to talk about this with these levels of automation. So there are many different levels, there's six, and these, you can understand on the left side of the screen are levels of automation, which means it's not self-driving, there has to be a human in the vehicle at all times managing all operations. And that even includes some of these higher levels of automation where you might have two or more automation technologies, such as a car that has both lane keeping assist, which helps you stay in the middle of the lane. And on top of that, that lane keeping assist might integrate with an automatic emergency braking system to prevent you from running into the next vehicle. This together would make it a level two vehicle. But unfortunately, some of the media and some stakeholders like Tesla would like to sell their products as though they are in fact self-driving. They are not. And that's unfortunately why the work of Mike's safety committee is so important because people misuse and misunderstand these technologies. And just this summer, we had an unfortunate series of fatalities in Texas where people misuse this technology. That's why it's important for us to know that on the right side of the screen is where we're working towards levels of automation that actually make these vehicles autonomous and self-driving. And I'll talk a little bit about the level four technologies that we're piloting and testing in Minnesota, including starting on August 25th, the Med City Mover in Rochester, Minnesota, where we're actually going to be piloting the shuttle that you see right on the screen. So a lot of people ask me, Kristen, when is this coming? When you're talking to industry and top researchers, what are they telling you? And I'm really curious, I wanna take a moment to engage you all in the chat box. I want to see what your assumptions are. Do you think that they're here today? Do you think they're coming in five years, in 10, 20, 50? I would love for you to take a moment and just type in the Zoom chat box uh, what you think that date is. 
Because quite frankly, the answer is we really don't know. There's different stakeholders that will tell you different dates. There's one in five government officials like me at the state and federal and local levels that will say, I actually don't believe it's ever coming safely and efficiently and affordably. There might be members of the public who are so skeptical of what they read that they also say, you know, I don't think this is coming, or if it is, it's not for 50 plus years. But a majority of the private sector that's developing these innovations is telling us something different. And a majority of those stakeholders tell us that these vehicles are coming in 30 years. So you see a lot of the difference in what different people are understanding as far as when these things might come. And that's indicative of the things that you see in the chat box here. Some people tell us that they think it's going to come in five years and others think it might not ever come. So keep those answers coming in because this is really interesting for our data and information for the CabEx office. But another thing we want everyone to understand and start thinking about is this is going to impact our lives much more than infrastructure and traffic signals or the way vehicles move. It's going to enormously impact all of the way society lives, work, and plays. So a couple examples here are vehicle registration and licensing. So in a future where we may 50 years from now have self-driving vehicles that can operate in all of Minnesota, we might not need driver's licenses. And so that means that people that can't have them, young people, aging communities, people with different abilities, they would actually be able to use these vehicles at many all times. Another key opportunity for us to think about is insurance and liability. Right now, there really isn't one product on the market that ensures some of these autonomous technologies. And so manufacturers are doing it on their own, which as you can imagine is quite expensive and not affordable for all families. And the other thing, as a lawyer myself, who used to practice products liability law, we understand that as you're integrating many, many sensors on one system, that might mean that if there's something wrong with one of the sensors and you get into a collision, you might have to sue 20 to 30 different companies just to figure out what happened. And this is really, really unfortunate for any sort of community member who's uh, lacking access to legal representation and the cost of legal services. And sometimes we talk about with different TZD stakeholders, even changes to, to societal trends and speeding. If these cars someday are programmed not to speed, will that change the way we think about time and how we arrive to work in social events at different times? Who knows? Well, those are the questions that we don't have answers to, but we're looking at them with Destination Cab, which is what we call our testing program here in the state of Minnesota. Now, my amazing team of eight full-time staff and two part-time staff, including one open position. So for anyone who's listening, CAVEX is hiring, and I would love to talk to you if you're interested in working for us and with us. And all of our amazing multidisciplinary team members, which include people with backgrounds in law, policy, civil and electrical engineering, project management, communications, engagement, and many other disciplines, are helping us work on many different activities focusing in six key areas you see here on the right side of the screen. We help support and convene the work of Mike's committee, the Innovation Alliance, and the Governor's Advisory Council, as well as sitting on many different national coalitions, helping to lead some of the work with ITS America, which works at Intelligent Transportation Systems, and even the Transportation Research Board. We also make sure to leverage partnerships, as Mike mentioned. We have a program called the Minnesota Cap Challenge, where any one of you or your stakeholders, public, private, or community member, can come to Minnesota CAVEX and say, I have an idea on how to test technologies to advance some of the solutions you're talking about. And through that partnership, we work with Fortune 500 companies like 3M and Polaris, but we also leverage the state's testing centers like the National Center for Autonomous Technologies, NCAT, which is actually right here in Minnesota, and the University of Minnesota ecosystem. And a shout out to some of my fellow researchers that are on the call. We're also very invested in policy. And as Mike said, that's really important, especially when it comes to some of the emerging trends like autonomous freight and connected freight, also known as truck platooning, where they convoy down the road together. And so two years ago, Minnesota passed a law authorizing truck platooning on certain Minnesota corridors, some of those that you see here in red on the screen. But we're also looking at different policies and practices, such as how we as a region, the 10 states called MASTO, are partnering together to look at a long range tenure vision. Now, foundational to this work is outreach. And you see some examples on the screen, whether it's the Med City Mover and engaging Rochester residents to understand if this is the future for them, or just hosting community workshops across the state. Our goal is to develop CAB ambassadors, hopefully someday all of you on the call so that you can help share this message so that it's more meaningful to your direct stakeholders and community members, families and friends. Now, foundational to all of this work is research, development and deployment, known as RD&D. 
And that's where I'm going to share an example of some of the research that we're doing with our partners at the universities, just briefly. But I want to also encourage you to think about research in so many different ways, such as human factors research, or how humans like or dislike the technologies that are being developed, and even how gender and racial equity is being thought about in the transportation system and as these technologies evolve. And finally, behind me, you see a set of plans from a 1933 Department of Highways plan. Just like we did 100 years ago planning for the current system, today we have to plan 50 and 100 years out. So whether it's the CAS strategic plan, which you see referenced here in the small screenshot, or looking at how our 20-year highway investment plan is thinking about CAV, we're trying to find how we can build for tomorrow today for our planning functions. So here's an example of some of the current and ongoing research with some of our partners at the University of Minnesota Mechanical Engineering Lab. Three years ago, Minnesota was the first state in the country to test out winter weather systems because we wondered whether or not they could actually see and operate in snow. And on the top right, you see one of those LIDAR sensors that I mentioned. The LIDAR detected a single snowflake as one of those purple objects and immediately stopped. And all the occupants came to an abrupt halt and the vehicle would not move forward, thinking it was a pedestrian or some sort of object to avoid. But as many of us know, in fact, 70% of Americans live in a climate that has precipitation we can't have a vehicle that functions that way. So we've been working with researchers and the LiDAR industry to update the systems, the sensors, and the software. And now we can develop with open source information and share information about how updated LiDAR and sensors can actually see in snow, which is what you see in the bottom right of the screen, which is an enormous achievement for this industry. One thing that I just wanna close with as I conclude and allow my much, much more expert friends to talk about this work, is our number one priority is outreach, education, and demonstrations. So if any of you are interested in hosting a community pilot, a community demonstration, please contact me. I will put the CAVX website on the chat link as I conclude, because we wanna hear from you. Whether it's joining us at the State Fair this September 3rd here in St. Paul, Minnesota, or it's joining us at the TZD conference later this year, where we'll have a much more in-depth session on this topic, we really wanna hear from you and see how we can support your community members to learn more and become more engaged. Last two plugs for the day. Please give us your ideas through the Minnesota CAP Challenge. I'll share the information on the web link, but we've met with over a hundred different vendors with amazing ideas. And out of every one idea that's submitted to us, we are able at least one out of three times to connect them with a partner. So between 33% of the folks that come out with us come out with some sort of partnership idea. So I encourage you to reach out. And last but not least, if there's a third thing you want to take away to your stakeholders, this is the messaging we're using. One is that CAV is new. It's different. We want all of us to have an opportunity to plan for the future and that as public agencies like Mike and Wayne and Lisa and I, we have an opportunity and an obligation to collaborate with all of you, including private companies and researchers. Because if we don't do that now, the private industry and CAV technology will emerge without us having a stake in the game. And we believe that as a safety committee and facilitation across the state, we can have a safer tomorrow. With that, I'm excited to hear from my colleagues. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Kristen. Um, great presentation. As we, as you know, so far we've seen CAV is here, and now it's all up to all of us to educate ourselves about it and to learn about it. And for the next section, I'm going to turn it over to Wayne Sandberg, and he is going to talk about some of the things that uh, the Association of Minnesota Counties um, and some of our local partners are doing to prepare themselves for the onslaught of CAB that will come eventually. Wayne, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Mike, and thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to speak today. As Mike said, my name is Wayne Sandberg. I serve as the Washington County Engineer. And um, I'm here to talk about how local road authorities are looking at connected and automated vehicles and what and kind of how we are trying to situate ourselves to best prepare and engage in what is an unknown future in this realm. And that really is important because if you were to take a look at the total mileage of public roadways in Minnesota, um, the vast majority of those are under the ownership of local agencies that's talking like counties, cities and townships. And so while we may not be on the cutting edge like the state is going to be on, on this technology, we're certainly going to be a key player as the technology um, advances through Minnesota. So if you are a local government or represent one, um, please know that there are many resources out there for you. You'll hear me talk in more detail about the work of the local road research board that is uh, what they're doing to help provide tools for local agencies. 
But in addition to the local road research board, I wanted to mention uh, the, Min the Association of Minnesota Counties and the Minnesota County Engineers Association. We've been working together to develop a connected and automated vehicle committee. Uh, this committee meets regularly with MnDOT and other stakeholders, and we're trying to identify trends and possibilities for local agencies. We're also coordinating with our city partners at the City Engineers Association. And uh, supplementing this work is also the North Central Institute of Transportation Engineers, NCITE. Uh, that organization is also starting an emerging technologies subcommittee. And the goal of that group will be to look at and spread education and information on CAV technology, among other innovations in our industry. And so I share all of this as a way to say to you that there are many ways for professionals in our industry to get and stay connected with CAV technology innovation. So if you leave here with one more thing, in addition to Kristen's things today, is that if you want to get involved and help guide how CAV is implemented in Minnesota, there are many opportunities for you to do so. And that ties in well with our topic, uh, the, the theme you've heard of, of communication and outreach. We all need to be CAV ambassadors moving forward. And so uh, get involved and there's many ways to do so. But I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the work of the Local Road Research Board. And you can find all the information that I'm gonna share and reference and more at the Local Road Research Board webpage. Just type in LRRB in Google and you'll find the link pops right up into our research portal. And there you can search and find all the research uh, that's available to you. Now, there are two reports that are there that are still relatively new and pertinent, and both were completed in 2019. First is how locals need to prepare for the future of V2V, that's vehicle to vehicle, and V2I, vehicle to infrastructure connected vehicles. And so um, the second one is preparing local agencies for the future of connected and autonomous vehicles. Now, both of these reports were completed in 2019, but they're still pretty relevant today. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what's in each report, just a brief summary. So if we take a closer look at the uh, preparing local agencies for the future report, we find that the conclusions as it relates to what locals should be doing now are actually fairly pragmatic. Um, and in many cases, very affordable. In many instances, these are things that could be rolled into your existing operational costs and procedures with minimal cost increases. For example, this, uh, that report recommends uh, under the pavement marking section, the main conclusion there is um, how agencies can best address pavement markings in the short term is to place lane lines after resurfacing, which you're probably already doing, maintain quality lane lines, so kind of keeping up on that maintenance, and then consider uh, using six inch lane lines as the new standard. So very simple, straightforward things. Uh, under the signing, for example, the main recommendation there is just to maintain signs in good retroreflective conditions. So do your night surveys, making sure you're, you're, you're managing your system and that signs are not blocked, you, trimming back trees and, and doing that kind of clearing. From a maintenance perspective, um, just implementing timely maintenance, particularly um, dealing with potholes and other surface anomalies. Um, and then under consistency and standardization, really taking a look at your system and, and making sure that it is consistent across the board. So for example, your signage is consistent from one roadway to the next. Now, it might even be that you can remove some signs and, and actually save money by going through an effort like this, all under the heading of being prepared for CAV. And then data, data to capture and information, uh, the main conclusion there is to develop inventories of features. So think about getting inventories of your system, all the aspects of it, start that now um, using ArcView and, and those kinds of inventory management systems. You'll be a well situated and well ahead uh, as CAV rolls out in your local area. And then communication infrastructure, the main recommendation there is just to consider those future communication needs on those connected vehicles. And think also about your highway planning as you're looking at uh, doing new roadways or upgrading roadways. When can you incorporate CAV thoughts or technology into those, those projects? Now taking a look, close look at that, that other study that I mentioned, how locals need to prepare for the connected vehicle communication. We actually find that the, the recommendations in that report are very similar with recommendations that local agencies should be focusing their efforts on maintaining road markings. Again, looking at those, those markings you're already doing and, and making sure that those are um, upgraded and, and, and well, well maintained. Maintaining clear road signs. So again, thinking about how the visibility and the retroreflectivity of your signs. Again, thinking about the design of your roads. And this is something the public is even picking up on. We're starting to hear at Washington County at open houses and other types of public engagement, people are asking us, how are you thinking about these kinds of vehicles in your design? 
Um, do we need to have this turn lane if connected vehicles are coming? They're asking really good questions and we as, as agencies and as professionals need to be ready to address and answer those. Um, I think somebody mentioned earlier the communication with uh, the signals, modernizing your signal controllers, take the opportunities when you have to upgrade those. So that, again, you're, you're, you're well situated as CAV rolls out. And then following guidance at the state and federal level, working with Kristen's team and others, um, asking questions and, and reaching out to really build those connections will situate you well. And LRB research continues. Um, there's two additional studies that are underway. The findings are not complete. You won't find the, any final reports on that web page, but there are a couple that I wanted to share with you. Uh, the first one is called Autonomous Vehicles. What should local agencies expect? And what this study is going to look at, this research is going to look at, is trying to answer the, these questions uh, for local agencies. So what should local agencies do to prepare? Is there something more than what we found in 2019? Is there something new we should be looking at more than just pavement markings and signs? What should you consider um, when the industry reaches out to you and starts asking, can we start to build connections to your infrastructure? What kind of questions should you ask? What are the resources out there for you? Policy issues, and certainly policymakers are gonna be a theme, uh, a, key, a key partner in as, as your agency rolls these things out. What policies should you be developing at a local level? And when you're reconstructing or adding traffic signage, what should you be considering there? And how do you prepare your, your, your overall uh, designs and infrastructure? A little bit more detail as you think about your design projects, what might be components you'd wanna add. The other current study I wanted to share is an analysis on the tool to estimate the safety impact of vehicle levels of automation on Minnesota roads. So as you heard Mike say, safety is absolutely our top priority. And this study is gonna look at all roads, not just local roads, with an eye to answering the questions, does automation reduce crashes and how, how does it, or how does it not? What factors influence safety performance of, of automated vehicles? Is it age, age of the vehicle, age of the driver? Do those have any factors? Weather, certainly in Minnesota, weather has gotta be a, a factor. How do we quantify that? How do we get past that? Uh, vehicle models, are there differences in the various manufacturers that we need to be aware of as, as road authorities? And all what does all this mean for road, for road authorities wrapping that all up? So there's a lot of research out there, a lot of resources today, and there's more coming. And I just really want to emphasize that um, as a practitioner, uh, please engage and look at these and stay abreast of these as they come out, because they're, hopefully they're going to be uh, setting a good template for, for you, whether you are with a local agency or you're, or you're working with a local agency. And so with that, I'll wrap up by just saying again, thank you all for the time to, uh, to speak to you today. And I'll certainly be around and stick around for any questions. And so with that, I guess I'll turn it back over to you, Mike. <laughs> okay, thanks, Wayne. You know, that, that last slide, that just, that cracked me up. And, and yeah, you're right. There's probably a few more lines we could, we could add to that one too, but um, that, that absolutely sums it up. And for our final presentation today, it is my pleasure to uh, bring back to many of you a return trip with Lisa Kahn's from the Minnesota Safety Council. Lisa, all yours. Thank you so much. Um, hi, friends. Today I have been asked to wrap things up and discuss my part um, in the <clears throat> Connected and Automated Transportation Technologies and the Safety Committee in which I serve on and talk a little bit about um, what the safety committee is like, um, what was my first experience with it, um, and where we're headed. And so no further ado, I'm going to just get started. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit, if I can get, oh, you know what, there we go. Um, when I work with employers and when I work with customers, the, the one thing I talk about here at the Minnesota Safety Council, <clears throat> the first question I ask of them is, what keeps you up at night? What are some of the things that are irking you that just keep you up at night in terms of traffic safety? what's really bothering you. And, and a lot of the same similarities come up. Backing, parking, lane change, running into fixed objects, distracted driving, fatigue, impairments, very similar. And I do a lot of presentations for industry on those same topics. One thing um, ha that has come up just recently, and I had a customer call me and they said, um, typically they do distracted driving and impairment. Um, in the fall, they do distracted driving and in the wintertime, they do impairment. And they said, this year, Lisa, can you do personal responsibility. Nobody wants to seem to take um, responsibility for their crashes anymore. And it's just really starting to, to ride on us. And I said, absolutely. I, I was all over that. I was excited about it. 
But I want to share with you what keeps me up at night. This is what keeps me up at night. This is what drives me during the day. This is what drives me every day. This is just ripped from the headlines. Um, it makes me not want to read the news. It makes me not want to open my email. It makes me not want to answer the phone. It makes me not want to go north on weekends because I am married to my phone. How many fatalities? It's Friday at four. Okay, now it's Friday at five. It's Saturday morning. It's Sunday. But it's also what gives me the energy to keep on keeping on. And when I look at these crashes and traffic and incidents, I always look at it and say, what could we have done to prevent this? What caused this? How can we fix it? And the one thing that sticks out in most of these is what caused this? How did this happen? Human error, human error, speed, distraction, impairment, the same type of thing over and over and over. So now enter my ask to be on the CAV safety committee. The timing was of the essence. This was way back in January, but the data and the issue wasn't any different than what's in the headline today. So the ask came in and it was pretty broad at the time. I received a couple of emails and one of the emails said this, this committee will help guide the state to ensure Minnesota's current and future transportation transportation system is safe for all modes of travel. I work at the Minnesota Safety Council as the Traffic Safety Programs Manager. Our mission is to strengthen, to strengthen individual families and organizations by help preventing injury and support healthier lives to help strengthen and support healthier lives by reducing crashes and risk and injury and safe. How could, I mean, sign me up. I have two children, I have a husband. Do I have to put them up for, for Hawk? How can, how can I become part of this group? The one thing I, I had been interested in CAV, I knew a lot about CAV, um, I, I became interested in CAV when I started working with the older population and the aging population. And when I learned mobility and transit was becoming such an issue for this particular population, it really, really, really became of interest to me. And the one thing that I really knew for certain is that connected and autonomous vehicle technology had the potential to not only prevent crashes, by removing human error, but it had the potential to save lives. It had the potential to take that equation of human error out of the mix by saving lives and reducing injuries. That in of itself is exciting. That should excite anybody. So I said, Let, yep, I wanna be part of this group, let's go. We're just gonna get everyone in an automated vehicle and everyone is gonna be safe and Minnesota is gonna be a great place. <clears throat> and how do we do this? But as Kristen and Mike said, it's going to be years before we fully automated and there was still a lot of learning to do. And so this committee got together and the first goal in the first meeting was let's dis discuss our goals. Kristen shared some of those goals, Mike shared some of our ideas and we came up with a plethora of here's what we wanna do, here's what we wanna go and here's some of the collaborating we wanna do. And friends, here is what we come, came up with. Perception versus reality. That's huge. That's huge. The title of this particular slide, the reason I gave that, that this title to this slide is because quite frankly, we, sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. And that causes a lack of understanding. And sometimes when we don't understand, that causes fear. And sometimes when it comes to CAV, and you talk to CAV about people outside of the traffic safety world, or you talk about traffic safety in general to people outside of the traffic safety world. They're fearful, they're defensive. I've been following social media and some of the other things about traffic safety campaigning right now and speed campaigns. And it's, oh, be careful, there's a speed trap going on. They're trying to meet quotas, watch where you're going. There's this defense mechanism. And something tells me, maybe it's just because you don't understand that speed is killing our family, our friends, and our colleagues on our roads right now. And if you knew that, 
in addition to higher presence of enforcement combined with education, you too would slow down on our roads. <coughs> so we, defined it, we decided we need to define CAV safety. That's extremely important because if there's a definition in layman's terms that everybody understands that we can communicate outside of our traffic safety realm, that we can share with others that's gonna resonate and make sense to people that we have an, a common conversation with at the water cooler. I know, right? Talk about calf safety at the water cooler, but we're going to, and I'm gonna to get to that. Because public opinion polls often show a broad public skepticism about AV technology and the industry grapples with the challenge of how to build. How are we going to build the public to trust this? And one of the initiatives that this committee has decided to take on is we're going to build that public trust by understanding what it is, how safe it is, and how it can build a more mobile and sustainable transportation system for all Minnesotans, not just some, but all. <coughs> Excuse me. And we want to help Minnesotans understand the safety benefits and opportunities of CAV. That's very important. And part of this is working with dealerships, as Mike had mentioned earlier, fewer dealerships are, um, they're just not even aware of the technology, let alone how it works. So having that common conversation with dealerships and with the individual who's purchasing that vehicle is extremely important. Um, it's important for the user, it's important for the seller, it's important for law enforcement to know how that, um, how that automation works. So we want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So after our first meeting, we came up with these goals and we came up with these ideas and here it is here. And then the one thing that we wanted to also do is really make sure acronyms are so fun and so easy to use in the traffic safety world. And especially when we're talking shop and sitting down and really getting into the nitty gritty of things and throwing words out like CAV and ADAS and um, all sorts of different acronyms. And so we really, really too um, had a conversation about we have to be very careful how we interchange certain acronyms. We're talking about CAV and CAV safety here. Now we have to be careful when we're using ADS, which means automatic driver systems and ADAS, which means advanced driver assistance systems and utilizing them in the appropriate context. So we're not confusing our audience because let's face it, when I was introduced to this committee, I am getting used to the whole, let's define cab and cab safety. And now we're gonna talk about driver assistance. And now we're gonna talk about this form of technology. So if it's confusing to me and I'm part of the community committee, it is going to be confusing to the end user. So let's really make sure we're talking about it and talking about it in the right format and the right instance if we're going to be communi um, communicating this to the end users. So we want to be able to explain the difference. We want to be able to talk about what's happening in Minnesota in a clear format with our partners and then outside of our partners. We want to, as partners and leaders in the industry, be able to share messages that make sense about what CAV is, what CAV safety is. And then we want to never ever, that last bullet is so important, we never want to quit learning. There's so much learning to do. We want to continually learn. We want to continually move forward in order, baby steps, in order for this to work. And then our collaborative measures. Um, Mike alluded to this. Um, Wayne alluded to this. We've all alluded to this. This is not going to work without everyone's help. Um, grass, which in, grassroots initiatives right now, I think we are going into a direction where word of mouth is so incredibly important right now. Um, traffic safety educators and education, working with our educators in schools and then going to that next level and working with our educators, with our aging audiences and renewing and refreshing um, and explaining how that equipment and their vehicles work. Um, TZD and traffic safety partners, an essential piece of the puzzle. Um, how does it work? And in, in that echelon, um, we talk about our TZD, mess, our TZD mission and how to create a culture for which traffic fatalities and serious injuries are no longer acceptable. The very first goal of that is to pursue public support on traffic safety as a priority. What a beautiful um, relationship to bring CAV into that echelon. Automobile dealers and manufacturers, I already discussed that. 
create that one-on-one um, working two-way relationship. Um, so they know when they're taking in a used vehicle that might have some cab technology before they turn around and sell that vehicle, what technology is in this vehicle in terms um, where they can turn around and sell it to a customer and teach them how to use a user's manual. Employers are a great avenue to work with. Um, they are your, your employer is your most valuable asset hands down. They drive to and from work. They drive on the work, the weekends, they drive after work. What a beautiful way to explain to your employers how wonderful this technology can be in terms of safety. It's a great tool. And then there's everybody. And that everybody is where we need to start having traffic safety conversations. It needs to be part of our daily conversation. How was your day? Talk about traffic safety. Talk about the numbers we're seeing in the news. Because quite honestly, our jobs are about saving lives. We're not going to see how many lives we saved on the front page of the newspaper. What we will see is those numbers go down and those tragedies disappear. I want to leave with sharing just a story about my father. It was probably about seven, maybe 10 years ago. If I say it was 10 years ago, it was longer than that. But we were up north and he drove my vehicle home. And um, it's about an hour and a half, two hour drive. And when he got into my driveway, he got out of the car and he said, Lisa, that was your car. This is a pretty good, nice car. That's a good drive. He goes, but oh my goodness, every mile or mile and a half, there was a beeping noise. Beep, 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 beep. And then it would beep again. He goes, it was so annoying. And I'm like, dad, how often were you going over the line? And he giggled. And so I explained to him that that was the, what, the line detector and that that was to keep him in between the lines. And so I'm not sure if it saved him that day or not, but it did its job. It kept dad between the white lines. And so let's fast forward. You know, I, I, he kind of said, your car did what? And so I was explaining the different bells and whistles to dad. And now let's fast forward to about four months ago and dad got a new pickup truck. And he was so excited to call me and tell me about all the new technology on his truck. And they drive south for the winter. And he was telling me about all the bells and whistles. And so I got to say to dad, your car does what? And we got to giggle about it. But the point of that story is today, take the time to find out your car does what? And share that story with your teen drivers and with your parents and with your neighbors. Make sure they know what their car does or doesn't do. Have the conversation, lead the conversation because together we're gonna take baby steps because the automation is here and it's only gonna get better, my friends. That's all I have for you today. And Mike, I'm gonna turn it back to you and open it up for questions. Very good, thank you very much, <clears throat> Lisa. That was uh, uh, very informative, we appreciate that. And I, I love that story about your dad and uh, how um, you know we're never too old to adapt. And uh, that I think is just a, is a great testimony to that. And for you know all of you in our audience, if you're driving anything that you know might even be five, six, seven years old, whether you know it or not, um, you're probably driving with some of these assist systems in whatever vehicle you are driving. And if you're aware of them and you know how to use them, you know, hey, that's great. Um, but I talk to people time and time again, and these are uh, folks who have bought new cars like Tesla or an Audi or something like that. Um, and, you know, the, when they go to pick it up, their education consists of maybe 15 minutes with a salesperson and that's it. And, and they're, they're not even beginning to touch the, the technology uh, that is actually at their fingertips. And some of the studies that I've read uh, also on a national level, um, when a driver doesn't use those assist technologies, it's called a disengagement, I believe is the terminology. And what they're finding is that there is a significant, scary number of disengagements that take place, especially prior to crashes. And what that tells us is drivers are not aware of the technology, they're not using it properly, or, and I think this might be more of a case, they're over-reliant on that technology to keep them out of the penalty box, so to speak, uh, when a crash happens. So we have a lot of work to do out there. And to you know, all of uh, my law enforcement partners that are on this call, um, if you are looking for something to get interested in and become a subject matter expert on for your agency, 
this is your opportunity because I'm going to tell you, you will be the first ones that are going to encounter this. And as recently as 18 to 24 months ago, um, I talked to law enforcement who have actually had contact with these automated vehicles that are being tested on Minnesota roads. And if you don't know what you're looking at or how to look at it or how to investigate a crash that potentially could involve uh, some of these uh, automated systems, um, then you know we're, we're not getting the data that we're gonna need in order to form those well-rounded and well-informed policy decisions uh, that Kristen and her crew are so good at developing and uh, helping to put forward to the legislature. So this is new, this is emerging, and this is not going away. CAV is here and it is only gonna become a much bigger part um, of all of our lives uh, as time goes forward. And I think as all of us realize, technology advances a lot faster than we think. But like I said earlier, that doesn't mean we're all gonna next Wednesday go hop into your, your little uh, George Jetson car and jet off to the office and not have to worry about anything in between. That, that just isn't gonna happen, but, but be aware that this is out there. So with that being said, um, I see Lynn has a hand up out there. Um, Lynn, do you wanna unmute yourself and go right ahead? Oh, Lynn accidentally had their hand up. Okay, probably clapping for the presentation, I, I would be willing to bet, so that's fine. Um, you know, I've got a couple things that I would just like to expand on, and I know we're, we're uh, coming up uh, on our closing time here, but I've got a, a couple things that I'd like to have our panelists comment on. Um, we're all involved in the Towards Zero Deaths program, and connected and automated vehicles and the technology that comes with them will contribute to the mission and the goals of the TZD program. So what I'd like to do, and I'll start with Wayne. Wayne, what do you think, and then we'll go to Lisa and Kristen, what, what can CAB do for TZD or what can TZD do for CAB that we're not doing right now? Where is an opportunity that we're not necessarily taking advantage of? Yeah, thanks, Mike. And there's probably a couple of different things that I think about when I think of that relationship between TZD and CAB. The first one being something I alluded to in the presentation was that you know, the public is hearing about this, but there's a knowledge gap out there. They come to the open houses, they come to our, our work sessions or our engagement opportunities, and they ask, you know, what are you doing? Um, how are you incorporating this technology? And maybe they don't even have the right words, but they're asking about it. I think we as professionals, whether we're whether it's with CAV or TZD or wherever you serve, really need to start um, helping. That's the second piece is, is that education and communication. It's been a theme throughout the whole discussion today. We become the, the educators as well as learners. And so it's, it's, it's reaching out and learning as much as you can about CAV as a professional, but then also being an advocate for that and talking about what it means to the community, to the public for safety, for efficiency, for equity. And a big piece of that that we're working on at the local level is our, our policymakers. You know, we're very close to our policymakers at the local level. They set our budgets. They decide where we go, what we build, what we do. And there's a knowledge gap there as well that we're working on. And, and that's a big piece of it. But it's also broader than that. And certainly it can be across the board through TZD as well. Mike, there is something wrong with your audio. Can you repeat that, please? Yeah, sorry. Your video, I mean, your audio is kind of garbled. I'm not sure what happened. Well, well, Mike's figuring that maybe I'll, I'll offer my idea and then we can hear from Lisa. Um, I This is a question I'm really, really curious about, especially as the Toward Zero Death and the Nation's Vision Zero program is really grappling with the additional e equity. So it, building off Wayne's point, I want to echo absolutely education is our number one priority as a state in that we must educate people with enough information so that they feel like they have enough to make informed decisions. And that decision might be we don't want CAV in our community or we need it in a different way. 
But more importantly, with the E regarding equity, I, I think we have to grapple with the sad statistic that in some communities of color, fatalities, traffic fatalities are sometimes double, if not triple. And so we are seeing disparate impacts of the stories that Lisa shared with us. And so if emerging technologies like CAF can help even a little bit mitigate some of those barriers and advance equity and reduce fatalities for disparate communities, we should be obligated to advance research in that area. And frankly, as someone who three plus years ago didn't even know what CAL was, and I was asked by our state leadership to join this program, that was what resonated with me as a, as a young woman from a small town with indigenous neighbors in South Dakota, growing up next to the Lakota. It was so important for me to understand that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for us to be on the cusp of a new revolution and actually be able to see the future in the long term and actually together with, with stakeholders and communities try and do that work together. I am going to piggyback on to what you said because that um, equity E is huge right now. And from a TZD perspective, what I would do is find out in your regions and your areas um, who in that area um, could rely on this mode of transportation. Because quite frankly, this is the mobility that could bridge the gap um, and really help some barriers. Um, it could allow for people to get to school, to work, healthy food, parks. And this can um, help members of community be stakeholders in transportation. And um, it, it increases a mobility independence. And so if you can really find out within your regions and your areas where these where these areas of equity are or um, your high areas of um, maybe you have a higher elderly population or you have a, um, a population that is a socioeconomic issue and you have people that are going to need mobility. Um, I, that is where I would start because this really can allow safe access. It's a safe access measure. And so to piggyback on what Kristen said, that's, that's where I would start right away and get those ambassadors within those areas on your team. Get to know them, get to know who those leaders are and add them to your team. Great, thanks Lisa. Is my audio any better now, Linda? Okay, perfect. Um, Linda, you uh, had one queued up, go ahead. BJ, feel free to unmute yourself. Vijay, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I can. Uh, go ahead, Vijay. Oh, we're, okay. we're, we're running a little tight, but go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, you mentioned education and outreach, and I fully agree with that because um, I have been in this uh, safety thing for last 14 years now. And um, I even met uh, Christine White many years ago. Uh, question is, we need to go one step further than the outreach advocacy. And this is where I am in the community, reaching out to people to communicate safety. And whatever you create, unless there is a closed loop in that you just advocate, you outreach, and then who communicates that message, DZD or Department of Transportation or Wayne or Lisa cannot do it alone. You got to have some, some, some people in the community pushing these people on a daily basis. And actually, I belong to that particular uh, attribute. Our foundation does that, and you, all of you in this meeting probably know about us. So I think we need to communicate to local communities at the green, you know, ground level, just like it is like a campaign, political campaign. You can make all sorts of strategies and these things unless it hits the man on the road, it won't work. So I think we need to extend that 
uh, outreach beyond to the advocacy level. And we have success behind us, Michael, uh, when we did the hands-free law. We had been outreaching for 10 years, but advocacy did it in less than two. And Vijay, I would just like to honor that. Welcome to the conversation. Great to have you. Vijay has an amazing story, everyone. So he should enter his organization's website into the chat box. But, but I think one thing he reminds us is that messaging is critical and we all need ambassadors to do this work. So one of the plans that Mike and the Safety Alliance, including the folks on this panel are working towards is growing ambassadors at the community and regional level so that it's not just the four of us talking about this or the 100 plus folks on this call, but everyone has the ability to talk about it. And the other thing we need to remember is that change messaging takes time, right? Remember how long when we introduced the seatbelt, it took for us to remind community users how important that was when it was introduced. It took years before it really became part and parcel of every single trip that we took. And so we just have to give some space and honor ourselves that we're doing a lot of work, but we might not see this change for quite some time. Thanks, Kristen, and thanks, Vijay. And Iten, I see that, that you have a question. You know, basically it comes down to how, how do we, we get this out in the community? How do we sell this uh, uh, as, as part of Toward Zero Deaths. And if I'm remembering correctly, you may be from the Duluth area or, or in, in that part of the state. And I would just urge everybody to be involved with your local, local safe roads coalitions. And that really is the vehicle that will help you find those avenues for selling traffic safety. And along with that, the safety benefits that uh, CAB is going to bring to it. Um, it, it really does come down to that. Traffic safety is, is local safety. It affects all of us, um, but not only in our local community, but as we travel through other communities going from point A to point B. Uh, so it is something that we all have a very strong uh, vested interest in. And so uh, it, it behooves all of us to be active uh, and to be part of the traffic safety solutions of the future, which will include CAP. So I know we've got uh, about a minute or a minute and a half left here. So I just I want to take care of a couple of, of things. First of all, uh, I want to just give a huge thank you to our panel members, to Kristen, to Lisa, and to Wayne. Um, I really appreciate your contributions to the con conversation today, to all the good information that you provided to all of us. To the audience out there, we gave you um, I can't even call this the Cliff Notes version. I can't even call this the crash version of uh, intro to CAV. Um, but what we did is hopefully gave you enough to start you thinking about it. At the TZD conference in October, we will have additional sessions that will be devoted to CAV and CAV education. And I strongly encourage all of you, especially our first responders, uh, to uh, take advantage of those. Uh, become educated, start to learn about how this is gonna impact what you do every day um, and how it can have a positive impact in your community. Um, technology will eventually save us from ourselves, but we have a long way to go before we get there. Um, and we have to use and make sure it's the right kind of technology. There's always unintended consequences when we, we, we embrace this kind of thing. And that's really why Kristen and her group are really going at this in a very deliberative way and trying to come up with uh, the, the best approach possible. And I would be very remiss if I didn't say a huge, huge, huge thank you to Linda and to Stephanie and to the crew at CTS for all that you do for the TZD program, for facilitating these, setting these up, taking care of all the technical stuff and, and dozens and dozens of other things that you do for us behind the scenes. You guys are absolutely great. Um, please take the time to fill out uh, the survey regarding today's presentation or future presentations. We really do enjoy that feedback and it helps us to put something out there that you find very, very useful. So with that being said, I see we are at the magic hour. I would just like to thank all of you for joining us today and a huge thank you for all that you do each and every day. Um, we're in a rough spot for traffic safety in Minnesota. It's gonna take all of us to really kind of redouble our efforts to help us get back on the right path. So thank you for what you're doing every day. You are saving lives every day. 
And I really enjoy working with all of you. Thank you all very much. And with that, we can call her a day. <laughs>